You guys good? <laughs> Internal. Well, good morning, everybody. It is good to be together. I am Pastor Daniel, pastor here at the McCordsville United Methodist Church. I want to welcome those that have gathered here in person and those gathered online for our 1111 Hour of Worship. A theme that I've been thinking about and really praying about lately is that of hope. And today, our hope and our prayer is that through everything that occurs within this hour and beyond in our lives, happens in such a way that our God can place his unshakable hope deep within our hearts and deep within our lives. That his hope would just be a constant thread, a constant theme throughout our days. Amen? Amen. Let's pray together. Father, we're just so thankful that we can gather here in your son's most holy name. We pray that through this hour of worship and beyond, we pray that you place each and every one of us upon your potter's wheel. And what we pray is that you mold us, shape us, form us to be a people that have hope at our core, hope at our center, and that we are a people that love like you. And we pray for everything that unfolds in this service, and we just pray that your Holy Spirit has his way. It's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Daniel. We stand with us as we begin to worship this morning. There's honey in the rock, water in the stone, manna on the ground, no matter where I go. I don't need to worry now that I know everything I need you got. There's honey in the rock. I'm praying for a miracle. Thirsty for the living well, only you can satisfy. The sweetness at the mercy seat, now taste it, it's not hard to see. Only you can satisfy. There's honey in the rock. 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 Freedom where the spirit is. Bounty in the wilderness. You will always satisfy. There's honey in the rock.
Declaring our faith together, please join me now in the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Take a moment. Say hello to one another. Hello to one another. Maybe seated, maybe seated, maybe seated. Do have some important tidbits to share with you. Some important, very, very important. I would almost call them strategic concerns, but that sounds concerning. That was for uh, Christina there in the back. Finance team is going to be meeting Thursday, July 13th. That is this Thursday, and that's going to be at 7 o'clock. Community breakfast is incoming. That is going to be Saturday, and that is going to be from 7.30 to 10 we're looking for folks to help serve and looking for folks to serve. So please, please mark your calendars for that community breakfast. Everyone is welcome. Also, that following day, the following day after, on the Sunday, July the 16th, at 5 o'clock, we are going to be having an old school, old fashioned hymn sing. I know we're going to have plenty of hymns to sing, hence the 100 plus suggestions that Tim and Jill have received. And we are also looking for folks to bring your favorite dessert to share with folks. And Tim was asking him to get those there a little before five in the four-ish, clock-ish range would be great. That way there's not any last minute having to dash about. So please, five o'clock is the hymn sing. If you want to bring dessert, please bring that in the four o'clock hour. Also, Lord's Acre team is going to be meeting Monday, July the 17th, and that is going to be at 7 o'clock, 7 o'clock. Also, Lord's Acre is incoming. Please mark your calendars for that. If you are wanting a uh, vendor spot, we do have applications on the round table, but the Lord's Acre is going to be September 15th and the 16th. I also want to thank all those that made our 4th of July uh, celebration a uh, success. Ended up grilling like 120, 130, I don't know how many hot dogs, but a lot of hot dogs. So uh, and we had some guests from the community show up. So really, it was a great time. I want to thank all those that were able to take part of that and to make that a success. It was fun. Yeah, I was surprised too even. Like people stopped just for an American flag. I was like, huh, never, I don't know why I never dreamed that would happen. But it did. And uh, it's kind of like an old pastime, you know. And, uh, but it was a good time. It was a good time. Corey? Stand with us once again as we continue to worship this morning. you now 
be seated. This morning, do we have some good news? It's always good to hear good news. Good news that we'd like to share with one another. Anybody? anybody? Yeah, Brenda? Oh, wow. <laughs> that is awesome. It is. It is, it is. You know, it also makes me think of something my dad likes to share. He's like, fish and family, after three days, they start to stink. <laughs> oh, mercy. It's a good one. <laughs> yes, any other good news? Any other? Any prayer concerns? We got any prayer concerns? Yeah. Son in law's. So Holly Evans lost. Holly Evans lost. Passed. Okay. Definitely prayers for the family. Absolutely. Any others? Any others? Well, do uh, ask for prayers for, for my family. Um, and I've been keeping folks kind of in the loop on what's going on with, uh, with dad and. Uh, this last week, it was uh, decided that he would uh, transition to uh, hospice care, and uh, so uh, so that is where that journey has uh, has kind of brought us. And uh, you know, my brother and I have been praying that Dad would just uh, they would be at peace, and uh, and and we still we, we we pray for that healing that that God can bring, and uh, and God can bring healing in many different ways. 
but um, but please please be in prayer for for uh, my family and, and and for my dad and and especially please be in prayer for my mom and uh, as her dad is also um, uh, in a, having to go under a dialysis and uh, so he's not in great health either so please 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 lift up Tammy Payton that's my mama and uh, and the rest of us. You know, a prayer that I've uh, been praying and probably will pray here is that, that God would just wrap his loving arms around us, each and every one of us, and, and draw us closer to him and closer to each other than we've ever been before. Amen to that. Amen to that. Let's pray together. Father, we just come before you now, realizing, knowing that we literally are your sheep. And as I look at the stained glass with you, Jesus, carrying a lamb, just pray that, Lord, that wherever we are in life, if it is that we need to carry, that, Lord, right now, that you would carry. Father, we pray for folks that are in a similar situation like my family, and we just ask that, God, that you'd wrap your loving arms around us. We pray for that unshakable hope to be at our core, and we just pray that, God, that through it all, we would keep our eyes fixed upon you, Jesus. Lord, I pray for my father, my dad, and just pray today that you would just reach out yet again, just like you did before. Reach out yet again and let him know that everything's going to be okay. That everything's going to be all right. That his family and his loved ones and he himself are all in your arms of care. So, Father, we pray also for our congregation, and we pray that, God, that you would continually just stoke the fires of our heart. That your flame of hope and your flame of love would not just be a flicker, but would be a blaze within us. And we pray that, God, that people would see you through us. The way we interact with people at work, the way we interact with our families, the way we interact with our neighbors. That, God, that your grace and your love and your hope and all that you are would just, just be shown through. And, Father, today we pray for our community, and we just pray for opportunities for us, your church, your people, to reach out to them. We pray for opportunities for conversation, opportunities for invitation, and we just pray that God, through us as a church, that more and more people will come to know you as Savior and as Lord. And now, Lord, we pray the prayer that you taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Well, this morning we're going to be kind of shifting gears a bit. We're jumping out of uh, Genesis as being our primary text, primary passages, and going to be looking into Exodus. And we are going to be journeying through Exodus a bit, looking at what God did through the life of Moses and the life of the Israelites. So we've kind of been on this Old Testament journey. It's going to be changing gears, but we're going to continue forward in it. And today's message is going to come around Exodus chapter 1, verses 1 through 7. And the title of that is let down well that was a major letdown has anyone ever felt that way before anyone ever felt that way before maybe after hotly anticipating the continuation of a movie series you go to the show hopes soaring high and leave feeling like your bucket of popcorn empty or maybe not just the season finale but the final episode of your favorite show I did a little Googling this week, and I Googled this one to see what some of the worst endings of series is, uh, were, and, and, and there was a number of shows that kept popping up on multiple sites, and some of those were Roseanne, the original series, and another show that folks online say had a horrible ending happened to be that of X-Files, X-Files, people were let down with the ending of X-Files, Ozark was another one that made the list. Seinfeld, Seinfeld, Battlestar Galactica, Corey loves this next one, 
the flash, the flash. And then there was Sherlock, Sherlock, Sherlock. Would anyone like to add a series to this list of shows that ended in a major letdown? Anyone? 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 First service, man, they were blurting some of them out. And I'm like, I'm not sure those were all church appropriate. I heard Sopranos. I was like, well, hmm. And then Dexter. I was like, yeah, that, nope, 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 nope. <laughs> but I would add one to the list. And my, my daughter disagrees with me on this, but that's okay. Outer Banks. They have confirmed a fourth season, but the current finale let me down. But we've all experienced letdowns before in life. Whether it was the ending of your favorite show or what happened with the Indianapolis Colts last season or discovering that neon sparklers, you know, little fireworks that they don't shoot out neon sparkles. Or if you drive all the way down to little Nashville, Indiana to go to this place called the Ooey Gooey Cinnamon Rolls house and you're greeted by the door saying closed until July 6th. And you were there on the third. That happened this week. Hmm. Or be misled by a billboard. We have all been let down before. And speaking of billboards, I won't forget the time that I saw on a billboard an advertisement for McDonald's bagel breakfast sandwiches. Here it is. That's what it said. Bagels are back, it said. And man, was I excited. I was just ecstatic. I looked at Sarah and I told her. We were driving along. I said, honey. Bagels are back! Man. Well, we saw this billboard on our way to Alpine Valley in Wisconsin. Of the next morning, and here's how you know I was excited. I got up and volunteered to go get us breakfast. I pulled into the McDonald's drive through giddy with excitement. Bagels are back, I thought. Bagels are back! I pulled up and I talked to the speaker, as our three-year-old Luke now likes to say when we pull up to the drive through He's all like, oh, go to talk to the speaker? Yes. And I proudly said to said speaker, I'll take a sausage, egg, and cheese bagel, please. To which the speaker rudely responded, we don't serve bagels, sir. To which I responded, well, I saw it on a billboard, to which the speaker said, we've never had bagels here, sir. To which I drove away and got breakfast at Chick-fil-A. <sighs> I was so let down at that moment. No bagels. I've been thinking about them for hours and crushed, crushed. But being let down, it hurts. and has a way of making you feel a bit hollow on the inside. Especially hollow when it has to do with more than TV shows and breakfast sandwiches. This was like something that ought to be there is not. It could come at the hearing of bad news. It can come by not getting the promotion you thought you were in line for. It can come when your doctor prescribes a medicine and said medicine just doesn't do the trick. If you're a toddler, it can come when your dad and not your mom or sister makes you a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. Last Thursday, I was on kid duty, and Debbie wasn't able to come to watch the kiddos that day, so they were in my care. Came time for lunch, and Luke said he wanted some ice cream. <laughs> to which I said, you got to eat something else first. And after five minutes of pouted silence, he finally told me what he wanted. He says, I need a buttered jelly. <laughs> I, oh, I love it how he says it, like a little redneck, oh, I need a butter jelly. <laughs> so I got the bread, I got the peanut butter, and got this wonderful strawberry jam that you can buy at Costco. And, uh, and I made old Lukey do his butter jelly. I cut it into nine beautiful squares. And I also cut the crust off, because I knew that was a thing. And I placed said butter jelly before King Luke, and he looked up at me like I was serving him dog poo. He said to me in a condescending tone, too big. So I went back and I cut those squares into rectangles. And I said it before King Luke again, to which he looked up at me with utter disappointment. And then he just hung his head and he just shook it from side to side. What have you done, did his posture say? 
I had completely let down King Luke, and he didn't eat a single rectangle of that sandwich, so we just had a standoff until nap time. Whether you're three or 93, letdowns can come in life. They come from items we purchase that break after one use. Uh, can come from how you feel after a surgery. Come from attempting to order the world's greatest breakfast sandwich. And it can come even from expectations that you can place upon other people. And when they come, depending on the severity, can they ache? At times, it's a dull ache, like your heart somehow has a toothache. <laughs> In other times, the pain from a letdown can be just be flat out debilitating causing a sort of paralysis in your heart paralysis in your emotions paralysis in your life and in your relationships but I have good news to share this morning there is one that is wholly incapable of letting us down there is one that we can lean on one that we can trust in one that we can put all our hopes in and know with absolute certainty that he will never in this life or beyond let us down. He has proven through the word and has proven through our lives thus far to be faithful, good, and true. The one I'm thinking of, speaking of, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Yahweh, as his name is in Hebrew. Which brings us to our passage this morning. I invite you to stand with me for these seven verses. These are the names of the sons of Israel who came to Egypt with Jacob, each with his household. Reuben, Simon, Levi, and Judah, Issachar, Zebulun, and Benjamin, Dan, and Naphtali, and Gad, and Asher. All the descendants of Jacob were 70 persons. Joseph was already in Egypt. Then Joseph died, and all his brothers, and all that generation. But the people of Israel were fruitful and increased greatly. They multiplied and grew exceedingly strong, so that the land was filled with them. Let's pray together. Holy Spirit, in this time of preaching and teaching, we pray that you bring the inspiration. We pray that the words that are spoken, that are words straight from your heart. We pray that this would be a time where you challenge us, where you by grace transform us. It's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. You may be seated. You know, I've never read Exodus chapter 1 verses 1 through 7 with Abraham's promise from God directly in mind. I don't know if it was just what all unfolded at the end of Genesis that took my attention off of Abraham, that is all that happened with Joseph and his brothers and all that drama, but I've typically in the past just read Exodus a bit separate from Genesis. Yet the way Exodus is written, it's written very much so as a continuation with all that has previously unfolded. How so? We'll start at verse 7. Where else is it in the Bible that the language of being fruitful and that of multiplying is used? Anyone that wasn't in the first service? Take a gander, take a guess. Mm. John Golden Gay, Old Testament scholar, he says, in describing the Israelites as fruitful, teeming, and numerous, Exodus also reminds the audience of the beginning of the entire series, Genesis 1. There God commissioned the creation to do that. Israel has done it. It has experienced the creation blessing on a stupendous scale. A fulfillment of a blessing of God here. God had blessed humanity and desired them to be fruitful and multiply. And here we see that Israel had done just that. Sometimes Old Testament prophecies can be cyclical in nature where they can come about in fulfillment and time and time again and at different degrees. And here we find that happening. But there is more. The word translated as land is the same word in Hebrew for earth and for country. 
So when Exodus says they filled the land, it was very intentionally including what has just been said about about in Exodus, about Genesis being fruitful and multiply. It is echoing intentionally Genesis 128. Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. But then backing up to the 12 sons of Israel and how their descendants filled the earth, and we're right back to Abraham. You remember what it was that God said to Abraham that his descendants would be like. He said they would be like the stars in the sky. Genesis 15, 4 through 5. And he, the Lord brought him outside and said, look toward heaven and number the stars if you are able to number them. And then he said to him, so shall your offspring be. Here in Exodus 1, we see that they have indeed become numerous. And it all started with a boy named Isaac. I had a son named Jacob, renamed Israel, who had 12 sons that ended up having some kids. But does anyone here come from a rather large family? Large family? It's a thing that doesn't seem to happen near as much these days, where families will have like 12 brothers and sisters, you know, or, you know, uh, Pops, my grandpa, was an only child. And, uh, you know, my brother and I, there's only two of us. Our family gatherings have always been kind of small and and intimate. But there are still families I know that when they have get-togethers, fill the house. Like Bruce Scott. When they have family get-togethers, there's dozens of people gather together. But I was curious about this, about families in America and how large these gatherings and, and families could be. And I did another Google, was quick on the Google this week. The largest family reunion recorded in U.S. history, according to the Guinness Book of World Records, is that of the Lilly family. They, at one of their family reunions at Flat Top, Virginia, had, and Corey, and no one from first service mentioned this, but anyone take a guess at how many they had? 200? 2,585 people show up. (laughs) That's so much family. I'm like, and like I said earlier, I'm like, could you imagine the drama there? Woo! Mercy sakes. But what's amazing about that, 2,585 people, you know, doesn't even hold a candle to how large Abraham's family had become by the time Exodus 1 had come about. Doesn't even hold a candle. His family was at least at this point in the neighborhood of tens of thousands. Tens of thousands. Some estimate that at their peak when they were the labor force of Pharaoh, some put the mark all the way up to about two million Israelites. One boy named Isaac. Hmm. That'd be a lot of cousins. Let's pull this back even further. Today alone, there are some 15 million Jews in the world. Jews are the apple of God's eyes. That's what the Bible calls them and believed to be descendants of Abraham. That's just today. How many millions have lived through the years previously? Then let's add in Christians because by Christ, we that are non-Jews, Gentiles, have been by faith grafted into the family tree of Abraham. Today, amongst all Christian denominations, there are some 2.6 billion believers in Jesus. That's just today. That number came out of in 100 AD of there being 7,000 Christians. Isn't that fascinating to think of? In the first century, they gathered up 7,000 Christians that was thought to believe to be. And that number blossomed out to 2.6 billion people. Think how many have lived and died between Christ's resurrection and today. That's definitely as numerous as the stars in the sky, is it not? All of this, all of these Point our roots all the way back to old Abraham. In Exodus 1, we find the initial blossoming out. All the stemming from one promise made by God to a man named Abraham. 
a single promise reiterated in many different ways that we've seen in Genesis. But all of that came from a single promise made by God. We today that believe in Christ are too a part of that original promise. We today in the sanctuary and online are part of the original promise that God made Abraham all those years ago. What this exclaims to me, shouts to me, says to me, is that of the faithfulness of God. And for many, that idea and what you may be going through could very well be the warm blanket of security that you need on the step of life that you're on. The faithfulness of God. We've sung about the faithfulness. We sang about the faithfulness of God earlier. But from one promise, God did that. If God can make good on that promise as he has, then just think of the good he could make on the countless other promises that you and I can hold to within the word. So often we rather hold on to insecurity, hold on to things like fear, instead of these promises that our God has made us. The outcomes of our hearts and lives, totally different depending And what it is we truly are holding on to. We live in a world where letdowns are a thing. We live in a world where we put our trust in others or a company and can they let us down? But this is just not so with God. My perspective of the Old Testament has shifted as of late. God being able to make good on the promise that he made Abraham through all the turmoil that is the Old Testament, and it is full of drama. This again shouts and exclaims and screams from the rooftops for me how committed he is to us, his people. How trustworthy he is for us. How we truly can lean the weight of our entire lives upon him. So often I've seen people do the same on different cultural fads. And time and time and time again, they're let down. I've often even seen people do this and put all their hopes and all their trust in in, in some new political movement. And again, let down, let down, let down. But not so with God. He is trustworthy. He is good. He is true. And unlike leaders that we could look to on the earth, (laughs) that they'll say whatever they can to gain whatever it is they're wanting, what he says is true. Say it like this. God is not like McDonald's. If he says something, he means it. As as Wayne Grudem said, God's faithfulness means that God will always do what he said and fulfill what he has promised. There are no misleading billboards by God. There are no misleading promises by God. Now, some Christians can misuse billboards, that's for sure. (laughs) But when God has said something, when God has promised something, he absolutely means it. And we shall not be let down when we put our trust, our full trust, all our hopes in him and what he has said. Spin this another way. There's been a book that's been bouncing about the Peyton household as of late. It's entitled The Hiding Place. The Hiding Place. And it's written by a lady by the name of Corey Tenboom. Anybody familiar with Corey Tenboom? We got half, yeah, about half. It's... Let me share a quote with you by her. It holds quite the punch. In God's faithfulness lies eternal security. Now, you may wonder why I said that quote holds quite the punch. Well, it's simply because from whom that quote came, Corey Ten Boom. She and her family, they were Christians in the Netherlands in the 1940s. This is when the Germans invaded the Netherlands. 
In 1942, a lady approached Cory Ten Boom and told her that her husband had been arrested by the Gestapo. And this began the ministry of the Ten Booms, where they saved an estimated 800 lives from the Germans and Nazis. In their home, they created a literal hiding place, came up with the idea of the book of Isaiah. This place they created in their home and watch shop was where Jews could hide when the Gestapo came around looking for Jews that they could imprison or throw into concentration camps. When they came knocking, the Tim Booms would ring an alarm and the Jews would know to run and to hide and to get into this hiding place. They believed that the work that they were doing was the work of the church. And I would say absolutely yes. They were very radically being the very hands and feet of Christ. At one point, a pastor was approached to take in a family. And the pastor said it was too dangerous for him to take part. But not so with those ten booms. Well, they eventually were ousted. A Dutchman who sided with the Germans approached the ten booms. And through a guise, they were busted. And were imprisoned for helping the Jews. Eventually they were sent to concentration camps themselves. I don't think any of us could imagine the horrors of what she and her family endured at the concentration camps. You know, we often get frustrated with things that happen in our lives. Place those frustrations up against what she went through. Oof. Inhumane doesn't even scratch the surface. At one point while there, Corey tells of a time where she grew thankful for fleas. Hmm. The fleas had gotten so bad that the guards would not go near them in fear of they too getting infested with fleas. Corey tells of how she became ever so grateful for those itching fleas for they were able to then be free from those guards and worship freely. Please. In 1944, her and her sister Betsy were making plans while at a concentration camp. This is what blows my mind. Making plans to start a camp of healing for those that were like them in concentration camps. So that when they were able to be released, that they could find healing. Her sister grew ill, though, and did not make it out of the camp. But before she died, knowing death imminent, She said to her sister, and I love this, there is no pit so deep that he is not deeper still. Shortly after this, through a clerical heir, Corey was released. A week later, all the women in her age group were sent to the gas chambers. Let me read that quote by her one more time. In God's faithfulness, lies eternal security. Do you see now why this quote holds such a punch? She got out of the consecration camp with her life. Her sister, many others did not. But even in the face of what she experienced there, being grateful for fleas even, she experienced in her life the faithfulness of God. And as she said, therein is security of the eternal nature. This doesn't mean that God will always work as we expect. But it does mean that we can trust, even in the midst of dire circumstances, that he will cause whatever we're going through, he will cause some way, somehow, for good to spring forth. It's classic Romans 8.28 He said, and we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. And remember, this comes from a man that was imprisoned and beaten and flogged and shipwrecked and in famines and, I mean, all points in between. And yet he could look back over his life like Corey Ten Boom and pen these words that we know with certainty that all things work together for good. For good. We, too, can trust, no matter what we are going through, that good will come. Will come out of even the worst of circumstances that we may find ourselves in. What we 
must do is not allow those circumstances to become our only and sole focus. We must remember these truths that we're talking about. That no matter what we are going through, God is still with us. He still is at work. And he is right now unfolding a plan through what we are going through for our good. It says David Wilkerson put it. This is a hard one. He says, our faith is not meant to get us out of a hard place or change our painful condition. Often this is what we want our faith to do. Somehow make life easier. <laughs> Rather, it is meant to reveal God's faithfulness to us in the midst of our dire situation. What I found is when this becomes our focus, that when we are, what we are going through, that God is faithful, it helps us to not only endure what we are going through, but to have hope in our hearts as we are going through it. We often want God to function like a genie in the lamp. Yet he knows beyond our wishes, beyond our wants, what truly is best for us, his kids. We can only see what is right before us. We can't see tomorrow. We can't see next year. We can't see 10 years, 20 years, 40 years down the road. And we often interpret life only through our immediate lens. And we allow what's going on right now to interpret everything. And we forget then that he can see much further down the path. And we forget then that he still is the God that has a plan for our life and is executing that plan no matter what is happening now. What we must do in these dire circumstances, situations, is remember his faithfulness. Remember his goodness. Remember where it has been in our life before that he has proven to be faithful, good, and true. Lisa Turkers puts this well when she says, fear makes us forgetful. And then she says, this is why we must purposefully look back and trace God's hand of faithfulness in our lives. So good. Fear causes us to interpret our circumstances only through the immediate dire lens. Fear causes us to push out of our minds and lives where God has proven his faithfulness to us in the past. Fear will even drive stories and truths from the Bible, from our minds and from our consciousness. And if we allow it, fear will become the sole focus. And instead of hope being in our hearts as we go through whatever we're going through, it's despair and hopelessness that's there. But when we remember his goodness, though, when we remember his faithfulness, though, when we remember truths like we trace God making good on the promise he made to Abraham, then we can gain a new perspective on the circumstances of our lives and see again and believe again that God, out of his faithfulness, will bring good. He, by his very nature, cannot and will not ever let you down. There could be seasons and moments where questions and doubts due to what is presently unfolding take you by storm. But when the dust settles, when you get to that place where hindsight is 2020, you will see, as Abraham from above has seen, as Corey Tinboom has seen, Saul in her life, and as Paul had seen in his life, that he is ever so faithful, ever so true, ever so good. Resting in that truth, rather than resting in that dire circumstance, or that difficult situation. Oh. That's such a different outcome for our hearts, for our minds. And for our lives. So in closing, worry not. God won't cut your butter jelly wrong. <laughs> worry not. God isn't in the misadvertisement of some billboards in Wisconsin. If he says there's bagel sandwiches, there shall be bagel sandwiches. <laughs> you can 
trust him. You can lean your entire life into him. You can because he is faithful, true, and good. And one day you, no matter what you're presently going through, will be able to look in that rearview mirror of life and see just how trustworthy he truly was and is. Corey? Amen. Will you stand with us one final time? Before we sing, though, I want to uh, I want to say how thankful I am for my wife and my sister running sound and video back there. They don't come from a technical uh, technical background, and they still come and and run sound and video for us every single week because we can't get any other volunteers to do it for us. So um, <laughs> if you would like to volunteer, yeah. So, um, so yeah, I'm, I'm so thankful that they come. You know, my sister drives 45 minutes every Sunday from Martinsville, Indiana. Oh, wait. It's 60 now because 465's closed. Um, so, yeah, my, my sister dedicates her, her Sunday mornings every week to, to running the video, and my wife, uh, even with our boys, dedicates her, her Sunday mornings to run sound for us. So I'm, I'm so thankful for them being here. Remember those walls that we called sin and shame They were like prisons that we couldn't escape But he came and he died and he rose Those walls are rubble now Remember those giants we called death and grave they were like mountains that stood in our way But he came and he died and he rose Those giants are dead now This is our God, this is who he is He loves us This is our God, this is what he does He saves us He bore the cross the grave, let heaven and earth proclaim, this is our God, King Jesus. Remember that fear that took our breath away, faith so weak that we could barely pray, but he heard every word. Every whisper Now those altars in the wilderness Tell the story of His painfulness Never once did He fail And He never will This is our God, this is who He is He saves us. 
I was thinking during that song, the, the power of perspective and, uh, and looking at what Jesus accomplished for us, you know, he beat the cross, beat the grave. And, and, and I'm just like, huh, sometimes it's so funny how we in, in America can get so like wound up by first world problems. But then you stop and you think about like folks like Corey Ten Boom and you think about Jesus and you think about what they endured and how love was still beating from their heart. And how hope still poured forth out of their lives. It gives me hope. You know, it really does give me hope. I'm like, huh. <laughs> just a random thought. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this time together. We just thank you that you've called us to gather here in this place and to worship you. We pray that as we go from this place that our focus would just stay locked upon you, Jesus. We pray that if we trip over ourselves and we trip over first world problems, we just pray that you help us to gain a new perspective. Help us to keep our eyes locked on you. It's in your son's name, in your name, Jesus, that we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.